one of the most successful things you ever see on Shark Tank was this one little guy with his, it's a sponge. It's a sponge with a smiley face on it. And it's a phenomenal thing because it got it sold everywhere because because it's a better sponge. It 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 literally is just a better mousetrap than right. the other alternative. And it because it has a little smiley, it's easy to clean spoons because you can push you know push the oh, spoon right the, through the, the mouth or whatever it is. Right. right. It, it sounds so silly, but that but that is a better product. That at the end of the day, with good distribution and good execution, and the fact that they got on Shark Tank, which he did work to get on, right. all of which worked. Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. Your host, Jeff Lerner, always thrilled to be here with you. Love getting to do this and pretend that it's actual work because really it's just having cool conversations with cool people and having a lot of fun. But uh, <laughs> glad to bring you this content. Hope you find value in it. Today, I am joined by Mark Angelo Coppola, who I'm riveted to talk to um, and, and dig deeper into his pretty incredible story. He's a storyteller a philanthropreneur, which I kind of get the sense is a term that he's, uh, if not coined, really helped define. And he's a farmer. Can't mm -hmm. wait to hear about that. Used to own a marketing agency, left it all behind to start a farm. He's the creator of the Valhalla Movement, mm -hmm. the founder of the Superhero Academy, which is, I, I don't know if that's like kind of like that school in X-Men or what, but we're going to dig in. Mark, <laughs> welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is great. Um, so, I mean, like, probably the obvious is like, dude, you're a farmer. You went from marketing agency owner to farmer. Like, let's, let's, well, you know what? Let's just start there. Yeah, let's unpack that. Um, yeah. What up with that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, here's, here's the biggest thing. I, I would say that I learned storytelling, philanthropeneurship, and farming all because of the same force that had rippled through my life. And the simplest way to express this is as I was graduating from university, I, I basically learned what I didn't want to do in the world. I, I hated university. At school, traditional education was absolutely horrible for me. And as I was kind of graduating I, and I was, I was angry, I was really, I was like kind of a local, I, I'm you know, born and raised here in Montreal. I went to a Montreal school, but it's kind of a world renowned school. So most of the students were from out of town. And so I was, I felt isolated from that community and as I would go to school, I would just kind of, I built up resentment over the years of, of, of going that eventually I decided that I was not going to let schooling get in the way of my education. And I was going to watch a documentary a week, every single week for 52 weeks straight. Now that ended up turning into eight and a half years of yeah. Ted talks and documentaries and, and audiobooks and you name it, I, I kind of expanded, but every single week I would learn about another problem in the world, right? I would learn about peak oil or climate change. I would learn about the where money comes from. I would learn about all these different challenges. And what I noticed, and I started to notice as a, a common thread between all of these different challenges, is that we had a narrative problem because almost every single one of these documentaries we spend 90, 95% of the time sounding the alarm, like saying, we have a problem, and then spend very little time actually empowering me, the viewer, to be able to, to actually step up and, and do something about it. And I understand that some of these com you know, topics are incredibly complex, but as this, the reality of the world kind of hit me and I kind of started having this existential crisis, I ended up opening up Google one day and I started typing in something and it was like, if everyone lived and then the autocomplete was the average American. So I clicked that and I learned that if everyone lived like she, the average American, we would need 4.1 planets to survive. 4.1 planets. And this is global, um, um, this is 2011. Okay, but I'm not an American. Americans consume a lot. I'm right. Canadian. It must be better, right? So I Googled Canadian number. It was five planets. Because turns out we have much less people, but we have such a big country that per capita, we're actually worse. We are consuming more yeah. per capita than Americans. 
And so I was like, wow. And I'm not the average American, uh, Canadian or American. I'm, I, I'm so fortunate in every single way. And I recognized that well, I had to do something about this. And so I walked out into the middle of a GMO corn and soya field, planted a tree and declared that it built the school I wish it could have gone to both physically and digitally and the community I wish it could have grew up in. And it's because I grew up in a neighborhood that was amazing, but at the same time, we didn't really know our neighbors, right? We were all kind of strangers. And I also grew up going to great schools, but those schools were teaching me a very standardized curriculum and not necessarily the alternative. And at the same time, as I was learning about these kind of causes that needed essentially philanthropic dollars, I also was an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur since I'm 18 years old. I was very lucky essentially to just find my passion and, and just kind of dive into something. I, the only job I ever had was working at the equivalent of a Home Depot here in Montreal. And I saved up all my money and I, I bought into an indoor skate park. And so as I was going to school full-time, I was also an entrepreneur full-time. And I started to recognize that if we were gonna take on the world's biggest challenges, we had to kind of merge the ROI of return on investment, which is what every entrepreneur and every business lives and breathes, and the ROI of ripple of impact. And that those two things didn't have to be mutually exclusive. And so for me, the idea of philanthropeneurship and storytelling and farming are all part of that same capacity. To build a movement, you need to be able to build a story. To build a business, you need to be able to market a business or market that story, market a brand to build a brand. And if you're going to build something that is going to be philanthropic in any way, shape, or form and address existential crises, you're also going to have to do that physically. And you're going to have to, what better way to do that than on a farm? What better scenario to build a community physically than by building an actual farm uh, to begin with? And I, and this is something I knew absolutely nothing about. I never planted a tree. I've never installed a solar panel. I've never built anything in my life. This was a pure, just moonshot. It was just, it was just something that bubbled up inside of me in truth, because I had an enormous amount of anxiety um, because this existential threat and all the conspiracy theories that I was learning about, like just way too much information was absorbed in way too short of a period of time. And, uh, and it changed me and it fundamentally changed me and it, and it set me off on this path. And, and now I'm a, a full-time farmer but I'm also a full-time storyteller and I'm also a full-time entrepreneur because they're no, they're, they require very similar skill sets. They require as an entrepreneur for you to understand that everything is like, kind of like an ecosystem, right? That your marketing department, your finance department, that your HR department is part of an ecosystem in the same way that a fruit tree is part of an ecosystem or that a tomato plant loves to be planted next to basil and next to asparagus because they do really well. And so these are principles that I learned in uh, something called permaculture or regenerative agriculture that I then apply to business and vice versa. Principles I learned in business, business I apply to the business of farming, which is the hardest business in the, on the planet, in my personal opinion. So there's just kind of this merge, is this marriage of all of these amazing things. And it just kind of created this counterbalance between two characters or two elements of my character that live inside of me. And, and, and it kind of, it plays to the hero archetype that I've, I think I've, I've always wanted to be, because if, if you were to ask me this question when I, when I was young, what, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? My answer was Batman. And so I kind of feel like that's what, kind of what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Huh, that's kind of what I'm living out in some way, shape or form. Yeah. I mean, first of all, brilliant, wonderful, inspiring. I feel great. I could just listen to you rhapsodize about what you were just talking about for an hour. Like we could just sit here for an hour and I'll just listen, but you know, sure. then, then, then people are like, he's a really lazy host. <laughs> um, so let me at least, you know, add some color, color questions. Please. Um, okay. I mean, really that's beautiful what you're doing though. Like I, it all makes very logical sense to me. And you know, I've, I've had my own journey to get me to this place where coincidentally I sold my marketing agency so that I could go into my next thing where, like we were talking about briefly before we hit record, you know, you learn the marketing skills oh. and you use the marketing skills in service to, let's call it just raw capitalism, sure. you know, companies just trying to fatten the bottom line. And that's, yep. that's cool because it's cool when skills work and produce a yep. result, but totally. it's not like life-changing, you know, awe-inspiring kind of work. But then when you, but the skills, damn, they're valuable. And then you go take them into the next thing where you're like, I want to 
I love that term ripple of impact. That's a yeah. different ROI. Yeah. That's when life gets really cool. And frankly, you described to a T exactly how I am and why I am where I am right now. The last two years, I'm trying to yeah. radically disrupt education on yep. planet earth using the same skills. You're trying to create, as I understand it, you know, a, a, a theory of uh, or practice of sustainability, yep. um, solve a lot of bigger problems. Props to you for that. So, so back me up. Let's, let's like wind into that moment for you. What, what happened between working at the Canadian equivalent of Home Depot and selling a marketing agency to go try to, you know, change the world? Yeah. I mean, really. And, and by the way, just like timeline wise, I, so I sold my first business, which was an indoor skate park. And that's where I, you, that's where I got the money to essentially go buy the farm and start the farm. Okay. Really the agency and the farm grew at the same time. They were actually one and the same because I was learning the initial, I was building a movement called Valhalla, the Valhalla movement by learning social media and telling stories through mainly using cameras and, and photography and Photoshop and these types of skills, all of which I was learning at the time. And that was the way I was paying my bills. And that was the way I was kind of growing the farm. But as I learned those, we, we end up doing like a Kickstarter and to do a Kickstarter, then you have to market in a particular way. You have to learn something about email marketing. And then once I learned that and we did, we had a really successful Kickstarter for the farm, then people want to hire me on the other side of, of things. Hey, can you do that for me? And so my entrepreneurial and my kind of farming career kind of grew and the, 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 the intersect or the, the bridge between those two is storytelling, right? For me, what led me to having that existential crisis is, is, was the story. The story was, I really truly believed, and sometimes I still do, that the world was gonna end, the sky was falling. I really was truly afraid of what was coming and what was happening. And, and I, I, I honestly, I'm afraid of it now. Like mm -hmm. the amount of money we're printing due to the, to, to, to the virus, right, is yeah. ridiculous. It's very scary. And there's these existential challenges that we're facing whether you're afraid of the virus or you're just worried about how much, you know, the money supply is, is ballooning in 2020, it's a phenomenally huge problem, but it's also a phenomenally huge opportunity. And so I started to learn about some of the solutions and then by documenting those solutions and documenting my own journey through those solutions, I was able to build this kind of farm and this movement. But as people would ask me questions, eventually I said, well, okay, well, maybe I start answering these questions and that's where I built Superhero Academy. So Superhero Academy is the digital footprint or trail of breadcrumbs that I created to document the journey of what I've learned building marketing stories, essentially a movement and agency. And so as I was gaining in one, I was doing something in the other. And so it's just been this kind of one step with the left foot, one step with the right foot, but it really is kind of as, as one foot is in the dirt and the others is... is in, in, you know, on the pavement. Right. And that's kind of this, this divide that I think I've bridged the gap on a, a many times over. And, and I'm just dedicated to it. I'm dedicated to building the physical community where people can come together and I can build a podcast studio and people can create, but also we can have farm table dinners right outside. You know, I'm build, I'm dedicated to building eco construction buildings and, 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 and buildings that are in line with nature, even though we're, you know, and, and they're off grid or off grid ready or off grid capable. Mm -hmm. And it's so, essentially I have this kind of true North and I've watched other entrepreneurs with very powerful true North be able to disrupt entire industries. And so I think I'm kind of doing the same. I'm just further behind, you know what I mean? Cause I'm, I'm just getting there. You know what I mean? Right, but right. if I look at somebody like an Elon Musk, he's doing the same thing. He came up with a vision. He came up with a plan and he's going in that direction. And I'm not here to compare myself to Elon Musk. I'm, I'm more so the, the main difference or the, the thing that I think I take away from farming that I bring to entrepreneurship that, most marketers or entrepreneurs don't tend to see have enough of, in my personal opinion, is long-term thinking. Everything about the farm has massive long-term implications in economics, some of which most people aren't thinking about. Like I'll give you an example, carbon taxes, right? Nobody's thinking about carbon taxes and how you can be a beneficiary of carbon taxes by owning trees. So if I buy a tree today, let's say it's a fruit tree, cost me 25 bucks, right? Well, the current value of a fruit tree is eventually it's gonna make fruit and it also is beautiful, right? Beautiful, can't monetize that. It's worth something, maybe monetize in tourism, but let's forget about that. 
yeah, I can sell fruit and you're not going to make that much money off selling fruit. But a tree sequesters carbon. Let's say over its lifetime, it sequesters one ton of carbon. Well, today, a ton of carbon on the market is about $50 USD, something like that. Okay. By 2030, it's expected to be $100, $130. We don't know exactly. The point is, we have a runaway problem called climate change. Whether you believe in it or not, it doesn't matter because carbon taxes are coming, specifically in Canada. They're already talking about it. They're already passed. It's already happening. Justin Trudeau is making this happen. And so everyone who lives in a nice, beautiful space, kind of like the one I'm in right now, they're carbon polluters for the most part. And the people who own trees are carbon sequestering. And so the value of a tree now has this massive, enormous hidden value that pays for the tree multiple times over in its lifetime, plus has all these other values like producing fruit, like it's beautiful, like it creates a lifestyle, like all these other things. Same with real estate. Farming real estate I knew was going to explode. Why? Because there's not more land on the planet and we're, the city is expanding. So there's so many reasons why I saw the business of farming being worth something, but I decided that I would make a bet you know, now eight years ago, that in 10 years or eight, 10 years would pay off so massively that, that it's irreplicable. And that's the way I approach everything. Even when it comes to school, uh, storytelling, when it comes to brand building, I approach everything from the perspective of building a brand, not a company. Yeah. A company is great. It, it's, it, you have a product, your capitalism, like you said, you're, you're just making the capitalism work. So yes, the the companies that are doing really great are doing phenomenal amounts of Facebook ads and they're making ROI saying, I'm spending a dollar and as long as I get a dollar 10 back out of the, the ROI of this, of this Facebook ad funnel, great, let's keep it moving. Let's, let's pump in as much money as possible. Great, love it. All, all for it, you know what I mean? I get it, I understand. And for me, I focus on real true fan building, real audience building, real like building the pathway or the pavement behind me that says, hey, when I want to build the disruption education system, the kind of, like you said, the, the X-Men school, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I need to build a very good on-ramp for that. And I need to build it with long-term sustainability in mind. So I started a school. It actually started as a podcast and I'm still running that podcast called Superhero Academy that built over time into a full-on school that with lots of students and build a brand. And that brand is now carrying me forward more and more and more than it ever would have. Now, could I have monetized it more? Absolutely. If I was treating it like a company, I could have made a lot more money. But the value that it brings to me today in terms of brand and where it's getting me now, irreplaceable. So I, I think I just approached life a little bit different and I, and I decided that one of my core values was long-term thinking, business, and in life. And that just it set me on this path and this journey that it has just shifted how I make decisions and where I make decisions from. I love it. We, um, you know, I talk a lot about in, in our organization, and I have a lot of the same, I, I think, um, congruent. Let's say I have a lot of congruent values and ideas. I don't want to say the same. Sure. Um, but we talk a lot about the law of the farm in my world, you know, which mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Covey wrote about the law of the farm. And um, mm -hmm. have you ever, I just got to ask, cause it's, it was such an influential book on me, but like, I never, I never come across people that have read it. Have you ever read a book called growth of the soil by Newt Hampson? I actually have not. So he was, he's basically like the, I don't know who would be like the, the great American writer, no, not Robert Frost, because he was the great American poet, but like the, like the sure. John Steinbeck or, or the Ernest Hemingway, right? Yeah. Only of, I want to say Norway. Okay. Newt Hampson. And he wrote a book called Growth of the Soil. That's mm -hmm. literally, the book is the story of a man building a farm. Mm -hmm. And that book, I read it when I was a teenager. My aunt gave it to me. And mm -hmm. it literally, right up there with like the fountainhead and, just a few, you know, a think and grow rich, awaken the giant within. I mean, it was massively impactful on me. And I think you'd probably love it. Um, I'm, I'm, I literally get to write it down. Yeah. <laughs> the, the growth of the soil. I'm, I'm, I'm it, right it, here it, in my it notes. It literally is like life lessons packaged in the story of a guy building a farm. Um, the biggest lessons I've ever gotten are from nature. Like landslide. 
landslide many, many, many times over. I'm constantly humbled by nature and the process of building a farm. It is incredibly difficult and incredibly rewarding. Yeah, you know, I love that you um, you talked about having a narrative problem. I, it, it seems to me so often narratives are very black and white narratives, very either, you know, nature versus nurture, mm -hmm. um, you know, capitalism or idealism, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know, like we, whatever. We, we separate the world into dichotomies. Yeah, oh, is it, and it's a false, di I mean, the concept of most dichotomies are false dichotomies. The, of course. There's always, you know, the, the third way. You hear people talk about the third way, right? Or the truth is in the middle. Um, I think that's really, really interesting. So, so where are you currently then on the uh, on this apocalypse journey? versus, you know, <laughs> the other, whatever yeah. the opposite of apocalypse is? I, I well, yeah, I, I would say, I would say that I'm, I'm oscillating on the spectrum on any one moment. And so when I first started, it was definitely revolution, apocalypse, it's coming, we need to be ready. We need to build the, the anti-system, essentially. We need to build the alternative in full. Right. Where I'm at now is less about building anti-something. It's just more about building something that truly works. And so we called it Valhalla because Valhalla, is, if, for those who don't know, is based on Norse mythology. Norse are the Vikings. That essentially they believe that the, if the Norse men, if, or, you know, the, the, the warriors of the Norse were to fight an honorable, sold, uh, an honorable uh, battle and they were to essentially live a, a life according to their values and according to the values of their gods, that they would go to the land of Asgard where they would train or, and hang out in this great hall called Valhalla to fight the battle of good versus evil. And this is a men and women thing, man. Norse women were also uh, warriors too, right? And so I believe that we're always in this kind of tug of war between good and evil in a sense. And you can put that into a dichotomy. You can say it's a Republican thing or a Democrat thing. You could say it's a left thing or a right thing in this way. You could say it's an anti this or a for that thing. Whatever it is that you think that the economy is, that's great. And I'm not here to preach the solutions or to tell you what those solutions are. What I know is that things that self-generate and that thrive and that build ecosystems are better than things that don't. <laughs> Period. That's what I know. I would prefer that my money makes money, right? If I'm a capitalist. And I would also prefer that my fruit trees make more fruit trees. Both of those are self-generating ecosystems, meaning I do work now that pays me more later, that gives me more than I, than I put in right now. And so if I'm willing to constantly invest in those types of investments, then I'm going to win in a way that is compounding. And I see through many economic books that I've read, but also through many farming books that I've read, the power of compounding interest, the compounding work. That if you do the work now, that sets you up for next year, so on and so forth, you're always winning. And as a farmer, you're constantly doing that, specifically one in, in a cold climate like Montreal. I'm always like, I'm, it's April and I'm talking about next April regularly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, we're going to prepare this many garden beds because we're going to plant this much garlic because we need this many garden beds to plant the garlic. But garlic is planted in the fall so that it comes back out in the summer, you know, next summer. So you're kind of always thinking about something well ahead of time compared to most companies tend to operate Q1, Q2, Q3. Oh, what's our budget right now? And what are we doing right now? And most people who work in those companies because they're not owners of the company, have to think in that short-term mindset. What do I have to do to not get fired this week, <laughs> right, right? right? So in that reality, we've got this kind of rabbit, this, this, uh, uh, this kind of rabbit hole that, is, that, that kind of creates this perpetual short-term thinking mindset in the world of, of, of doom and gloom. And that short-term mindset is hurting us big time. And if I look at, you know, if I compare China and America today, I would say that China is taking a much longer term approach oh, yeah. oh, to the yeah. way that they are structuring their version of capitalism. You can call it communism, but it's also capitalism. They have hyper capitalism there, in fact, in many ways. But the, the, the kind of investments they're making in other countries, the building of the Silk, uh, the rebuilding of the Silk Road by, by investing in other countries, by the way that they have a communal mindset in many ways in culture, 
the capacity for what China is doing is skyrocketing them ahead of what I think America is innovating in terms of pace. Now, Americans have innovated in certain things that keep them in the game big time, in the money world, in the military world, and in the narrative world or culture world. America still leads, right? The American dollar is still the reserve currency of the world. The culture is still the dominant culture and the military is still the dominant military, mm -hmm. but they're losing ground. And, and I say this as a Canadian, because I would say my culture is American culture. Canadian culture is mainly American culture. And so the capacity for us to see the dichotomies of these two kind of, these two different philosophies and how they're playing out, I think has just kind of informed me to, to recognize, look, I think we're gonna be okay, but I don't think everyone's gonna be okay. Right, I'm through the through this the, the you know the radical shifts that we've seen in 2020. I'm thriving. I'm doing amazing. I don't I don't think my business has ever been any better. But I also know that I live in the dichotomy where a lot of people are losing their shirt off their back, and a lot of people are suffering. And so I, I recognize my fortune within that. I recognize the fortune I have with my health. I recognize the fortune I have of being a white male. I recognize the fortune of being born in Canada. I recognize a, a thousand one different fortunes. But I also know that a generation before me, my parents were poor, like super poor. And so I just value things powerfully. I, I come from kind of immigrant mentality because my parents are immigrants. And I, I just, I think I just apply that forward. And so I'm, constantly fueled by one and the other. Here's what I'll say though, the biggest thing that shifted for me recently is that for most of the years I was building this farm and building this movement, I was fueled by the negative side of it, meaning the apocalyptic side of it. It was almost like I was burning a, a, uh, a fossil fuel of sorts. It was like adding fuel to the fire, but it kept me going, kept me going. I found a way to hustle, 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 right. make it happen. And that's great, but I've actually been able to shift into a much more renewable fuel where I'm building out of love. I truly love building a farm. I truly love running a podcast. I truly love teaching. And by having shifted that internally through the use of psychedelics and a bunch of other things that are also a huge help, also some form of coaching, therapy, I've hired a ton of people, uh, failures, failures in business as well. Um, there's a thousand and one different reasons why I'm at where I'm at today. But what I can say is I'm building out of love today, love for the craft, love for the process, love for the journey, love for documenting the journey that I, I would say I'm much closer to this, to the paradise side of Valhalla than I am to the doom and gloom side of Valhalla, let's say. So first of all, I love that you clustered psychedelics, therapy, and coaching. <laughs> they, really, they really are all like members of the same set. They're just, they're all, they just change your perspective, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I love that. And uh, I, how old are you? Can I ask? 32. 32. Okay. So I'm 41. And I will tell you about two, about three, I guess you would, the seeds were planted four years ago. I had literally the same, I mean, I use almost the exact same language that you're using to go from the negative to the side of love, from the hustle, which is, you know, kind of reliant on what feels like a finite resource of, of will and drive and this fuel you have to constantly mine to more of just like service yep. and, and a little bit of patience, mm -hmm. um, you know, taking a longer view. And uh, I had that same shift in the last three or four years. So first of all, props to you for having it, you know, maybe around, you know, almost in your late twenties. I mean, most 20 year olds are knuckleheads, 20 somethings, and you were getting clear on some of the really good stuff. So kudos to that. And, and I will say, you know, my, my show, it's called Millionaire Secrets and, and I'll own it straight up. It's a total bait and switch. Don't People know. come to the show thinking they're going to get a millionaire secret, like the, the Q1 secret to be a millionaire by Q2. And it's like, no, I mean, we're having this conversation. It's like, no, the secret is that life is a farm. Business is a farm. You plant, you reap, or you plant, you sow, you harvest, you reap, yep. you water, you, you learn, you become excellent. Yep. And also it's not fair in so far as fair means everyone's going to win because yeah, they're not, they're not like the, the best are going to win and most people are not. And that's okay yep. because it's literally being really good is available to everyone as an option. A hundred percent. 
right? <laughs> I, I, no, I, I mean, I, I fully agree. I, look, it's not to say that we all start at the same start line, right? I get that, but it doesn't mean that your capacity for or anyone's capacity to really apply themselves and get ahead can be there in every single way, shape or form. And I've walked, I've, there's just so many examples of it and we can play the victim and a lot of people love to play the victim and they love to essentially play that card. And there's just no use to that. And in my personal opinion, it's just not worth it at all because it's a, it's a negative fuel source. Right. It's just not actually, like, I get it. Like, look, I was fueled forever wanting to prove to my mom that I didn't need a normal job. My mom to this day will still sometimes say like, when are you going to get a real job? And I outpace her earnings like 10 X, if not like it, it, it doesn't even matter how much money I make because right. I have a real job. I've been self-employed for 14 years. You know right. what I mean? Like I'm, I'm clearly making, like, I don't, I, I don't have debt. I have nothing. I've been self-employed for 14 years. And in fact, I'm a net hire. I have a ton of teams of people, companies have sold all kinds of stuff, but I still get that, that when are you yeah. going to get a real job? And forever that fueled me forever. That was like, Oh, let me show you. Right. And it was always some version of that. Right. I can do it without this or no, no, no. And honestly, I just, there's so much available to you. Now more than ever, you have access to Look, this podcast is free, right? Mm -hmm. YouTube university is free. There's so much alternative opportunity for you to learn. And even if you do pay for it and you go on Skillshare and you pay $11 a month, you've got an enormous value. There's an enormous democratization of knowledge and information. And there are no shortage of influencers and, and leaders and masters that are willing to teach at an incredibly reasonable price or to just take on apprentices, even if it's no money. So find people who have walked the path before you and walk that path. And that's the same, the same is true in farming. It's how farms get passed down, right? You learn mm -hmm. from a farmer, which all of which I did the wrong way, but eventually I found farmers and I learned. And the same is true in entrepreneurship and the same is true in whatever it is you want to do. So you want to be a videographer? Great. You want to be a designer? Great. Learn from other videographers and designers. Learn through applying yourself and showing up and being humble and recognizing that you don't know everything and you're always learning. And, I, and that's, that's the mindset. Again, that's one of my core values is that I'm always the student. I'm always learning. I'm, I don't care who is in front of me because I'm going to treat them with the same kind of respect that I want to be treated no matter what. And so that, that builds up over time. There's, there's a huge amount of, of opportunity that builds up over time. Now, sure. There's luck involved too. I can go have lunch at the, at the right dinner and at the right place and hear somebody talking about something or sit on a plane next to someone and get an opportunity that skyrockets my career. Yes, that's possible. But I also still made the choice to be on the plane. And I also had the character to listen rather than just be lost in my headphones or the character to speak to somebody on next to me on the plane and say, hello. And so I, I truly believe we re, like, we reap what we sow. We it's, it is the farming lesson of all farming lessons, but it is, it is just real. So a couple things in, in what you just said, you know, I was talking about the millionaire secret. Um, yeah. Let me, let me say this, you know, first of all, long-term thinking is, I don't know if there's one millionaire secret, but it's a big millionaire secret. It's definitely a pretty big one. Yeah. That's a big one. And, and when I say bait and switch, what I mean is people, I think, you know, the hook is like, like I even run ads online. It says, I'll teach you the fastest way to become a millionaire. Really? I didn't say I was going to teach you the fast way. I just said yeah. the fastest. And the fastest is going to be to make some mental shifts that get you, you know, the best probability and the best, you know, that compress time as much as possible. Um, and that's, you know, really, I think that long-term thinking is, uh, is absolutely essential. And I think that's, you know, I'm always looking, like I try, I have this, like this, uh, sort of delicate relationship with like employment. Cause I don't want to be like the anti get a job guy, because first of all, that just marginalizes you to the point of ridiculousness. Like most people have jobs and you can't say nobody should get a job. Cause then nobody would do the jobs. Totally. But I think you've helped me actually clarify what my real issue is, which is most employment promotes very short-term thinking. Yes. Um, like you said, either don't get fired today or hit our numbers this quarter or qualify for my bonus or, you know, or just try to impress the person above you. Essentially yeah. you're, you're always doing something where you're no, you're not innovating. You're just trying to do the thing that is expected of you, which in and of itself is not being, it's, 
it's kind of be, being a student, but in a way that says I'm writing the exam and just writing the exam to pass it. But the second the exam is done, you no longer have the information. You never yeah. really learned. You never innovate. Which, which by the and way, is that's, actually that's, how school tends to be too. Like, that's exactly how school tends yeah. to be. That's why I hate it. That's why I, that's why I'm decided to build a school that, that changes. Yeah. You know, and school, <laughs> school really does uh, it properly condition and, and prepare employees from the standpoint of like, Oh great. You passed your exam. You're done for the quarter. Oh great. You hit your numbers. You got your bonus now on to the next quarter. Like it's, it's not long-term thinking. It really is. No, but I mean, it's not even long-term thinking in the sense that here's, here's the, the biggest proof of long that it's not long-term thinking. How many people are saying, I'm going to sign up. I'm going to go to school to be an accountant or a lawyer and never spent a day actually going to a law firm and actually spending time being, being with right. lawyers or being with accountants, period. How many people can graduate out of university and the next day can get a job in an accounting firm and without any support can just kind of go and do accounting? They can't. Right. So right. that's bullshit. Like that's, and, and in particularly in America where the student debt crisis is massive and it's just getting crazier and crazier and crazier. I just can't justify it. Now, fine. You need a piece of paper to become a doctor. I get it. There's, there are certain things that require certification. And I, I understand that. I'm not saying, I'm not hating on all traditional education, but if it's the only education you're getting and you only have a mentality that you have to pass the exam to go get the job and get the piece of paper, you've lost. You've already have a losing mentality in my personal opinion. It's, and it's not about the information that you know or don't know. It's not about the grade that you get or don't get. It's the mentality that you have that is short term, therefore, is going to lose at some point. It's a game of snakes and ladders, and you're gonna hit a snake. Yeah. You're gonna like, but long term thinkers and might hit a snake from time to time, but for the most part, they're gonna find the ladders. And so it's just because they're they're operating slower, they're moving slower, they're making decisions in a different way that long term are reinvesting their their capital that they get that comes their way or the time or the energy. They're just constantly investing in a different way that accumulates. And that is how real wealth is built. And you speak to any rich person talking about capital, talking about money and how they invest money, but also how they invest time and energy and relationships and all that kind of stuff. That's everything they'll tell you. Yeah. And, and in my experience, it requires a level of what most people would view as, as obsession, probably to the point of neurosis. Yep. And I think people, people that look at it that way don't appreciate that when you're going to be different than the world, you have to be really different from the world yep. or else the world is, is so clawing and contagious. It'll just kind of suck you back to the mean. Yep. You got to be like way over there on the fringe just to not end up drifting back. Yep. You know, it's like any, any movement has to be extreme in its infancy so that it doesn't get absorbed by the mainstream. If anything is actually going to change. Perfect. Perfectly said. <laughs> it's, it's perfectly said. And it, because it's, it's hundred percent true. And I think, you know, we have this narrative and one of the narratives I'm, I'm helping reimagine is, is reimagining the 1%, the idea behind the 1%, the concept mm -hmm. of the 1%. Look, I get it. 1% of people have whatever it is, 50% of the world's wealth. That's crazy. That's wild. Okay. It's a, it's a huge slanted field in many different ways, but 1% of people do not have 50% of the world's talent. In fact, 1% of people have 1% of the world's talent. Right. That is democracy. Time, your time and your talent is the most democratic thing that you have. Because Elon Musk, who has billions, and uh, Tim Cook, who has billions, has just as many hours in the day as you do. Now, he has a lot of money that saves him a lot of hours and can deploy a lot of resources that save a lot of time that accelerate the path. But they weren't always there, right? And if you become best 1% at something in the world, mm -hmm. whether it be storytelling or whether it be podcasting or whether it be videography or whether it be whatever it is that you art of any kind, any talent of any kind. If you just focus on putting in your 10,000 hours, your 20,000 hours, your 50,000 hours, okay? If you bullet down that and really get really, really, really good at world-class at something and you master something and you become a black belt at something essentially, you're gonna have a career that is gonna really reward you in a big way. And if you do that in a way that is giving, you do that in a way that's not tearing other people down, or you do that in a way that's networking, if you kind of are a decent human being and you also are one of the best in the world at something, you're probably going to be incredibly successful. You will be, you will be a millionaire. I will bet on it every time. So if I could buy stock in anyone, I would buy stock in the person who's obsessed 
with being the best at something. Now, some people can do that through a job. Like you don't, not everyone's meant to be an entrepreneur at all. In fact, being an entrepreneur is being an ecosystem builder. It's, it's kind of, you tend to get really good at multiple things and being more of a jack of all trades than you are at being really, really good at certain specific things. And so you, you, you tend to find a niche and that niche tends to be this kind of vertical that you end up building in, whether that be in our case, it was like, let's say marketing, if you want to use that term, in my case, it was storytelling. But at the end of the day, you're still kind of, I still, I know an enormous amount about finance. I know an enormous amount about HR and hiring. I know an enormous amount about all these other things that are, that are part of building a business that are very difficult to master all at once. But that's why it took me 14 years to, to in my opinion, only now be kind of breaking through into the, what I would consider to be the 1% of storytelling. Only now do I think I'm kind of getting there. And by the way, this is saying this, I've reached millions of people online with stories I've told. Brands that I've built, the launches that I've done, I've raised millions of dollars on Kickstarters that I've, I've supported or been a part of or been the marketing director of. I've, I've made funnels that make hundreds of, like millions and millions and millions of dollars. Only now do I think I'm kind of getting there. And even then, I still look ahead and I see mentors and people who are way ahead of me. And, mm -hmm. and it's because of that obsession that I have around storytelling that I've learned a thing or two. And, it, and it's gotten down to details of things. This background here that you're seeing, that you're looking at, right? It's not by accident. The way I move my hands is not by, like I started to get to the point of obsession around a particular skill set that I then apply to other things. And I think that same mentality applied to any skill set has a very similar outcome for many. Yeah, that, I, I, I love that, 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 obsession. I love the 1% redefining the 1%. I just, the, the American Western capitalist in me just has to say for the benefit of anyone that thinks that 1% wealth distribution statistic is just so unfair. Cause it's, I actually, I, a couple of days ago when I read it online, I think it was 42% that the 1% holds oh, up true. the world's wealth. Yeah. You have to understand. It's not like there was a pie they got carved into a hundred slices and then one person went and took 42 slices. No, no, that's no. not how it works. No nope. money wealth multiplies through industry and innovation. Mm -hmm. And the 1% are the people that have built the most industry and conducted the most innovation to bake the most new pies. Yep. So they have 40% of the pies, but it's not because they stole your slice of pie it's because they germinated a whole new pie with their little slice of pie. The money supply expands, resources expand, industry expands as fil filtered through technological innovation and efficiency. It's yep. not unfair. It, it, look, the game is the same for all of us. We're all playing the game. Now, again, it's different if you're born in Africa versus you're born in America. I get it. I understand that we're not all- but that, Exactly. Country. But who, who's the number one person that's done more for Africa in the last 50 years than all the countries in the world? Oh, absolutely. And here's what I'll, right? here's what I'll say. Peter Diamandis said it great, in an amazing way. And, and I think it's in bold, in his book, Bold. He talks about if you want to be a billionaire, solve a billion person problem. Right. Read. Entrepreneurs solve problems. Businesses- solve problems companies solve problems brands solve problems by making their it their brand mm -hmm. to take on a particular mission or vision and carry that vision and mission forward so the difference between ford which is sell as many cars as possible not when it first started but now right. versus tesla is that tesla's goal is to bring on the the advancement of sustainable energy throughout the planet there is a very different very different goal between those two things. And therefore, there's a reason why Tesla is the biggest car company combined compared to all other car companies stacked together in terms of valuation in the stock market. It's because people believe in a vision and an mission and in a brand way more than they believe in just pure capitalism. Right. Things. Because they just trust it in a different way. And, 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 and to think that they did that with zero dollars in marketing. I don't want to say zero dollars because they do they do a lot of branding. That's different. The way the cars look, the the logo, the the way yeah. they host their events, like they still do marketing. They just do it different than most brands do, and they spend a lot less money doing it because they're telling real stories because they really believe and are really doing the thing that they're trying to do. Now, are they perfect at it? Of course not. Is the company potentially way overvalued? Sure, but who's to say? 
right? Who's to say that this company should be worth this or that? We're the determinants of that. We're the ones who made the billionaires because we bought their stuff and, and, and we bought from their company. So it, should there be re, a redistribution? Potentially, should there be better ways of figuring out things? I, look, I'm not here to tell you all the macroeconomic solutions to things, but I think what you said is, is incredibly reasonable. We did not divide the pie into 100 pieces and then somebody just stole 40. Okay? Right. We did innovate and people who innovated more and who sacrificed and who had longer term thinking or foresight or vision win sometimes. Right. And they win. They just win in a different way than most people win. And it's because they have a different mentality. And look, if you're listening to this, you have a nine to five and that's what you're happy with, great. But then don't complain that you're not a billionaire because you're not going to be a billionaire with a nine to five mentality where you're, where you're trading time for money. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, if, you're, if you have a nine to five, you're actually probably only solving one person's problem, which is your direct report boss. Sure. Who like yeah. needs you to do your work. So and you're basically solving your problem, which is I right. need money. And then you're kind of solving your kids' problems, your family's right. problems. Right, right. Kind of. But that's a very small pool of people compared to just from, I'll take myself as rather than pointing to anybody else. I'm trying to solve a lot of people's problems by building education that is accessible when I'm sleeping. So the scale of which I've invested in making videos and courses and all these other things is getting wider and wider and wider in its capacity, not necessarily that it's made in billions of dollars, millions of dollars, but, but it's capacity to potentially do that. And by investing in that capacity and investing in that long-term format, I have the capacity to pop. And so at some point, if Superhero Academy goes extremely viral, like it has in the past, when we went from 4,000 followers to 400,000 followers in 90 days, when we did that, mm -hmm. we grew the company massively. I can do that again. And so, and I will surely. And it's just a question of being ready for that opportunity. I don't know when that happens necessarily. I can engineer things. I understand things about that. I know when I can put and execute dollars, but I'm not, I'm not currently in the launch phase or the money accumulation phase of this brand. I'm in the brand building phase of this brand. And so, and I'm okay with that. And, and so, you yeah. know, there's a, there's a piece of art. You kind of can't see it behind me, but it says, just do it on it. Right. It's I one of the many it, yeah. things. Yeah. One of the many things that it, it says, just do it. Now, when I say, just do it, which brand comes to mind, right? Obviously. We all know. Nike, yeah. Exactly. We all know. And so what's amazing about that is Nike has spent millions, billions of dollars making association between athlete and product or ideal idea and product. And, and the fact that they have a logo that is incredibly recognizable, a message that at the end of the day is very, very simple, just do it. That is, a, that is incredible to own. That is an incredibly powerful mental real estate component, like attention real estate idea that they've been able to sell a thousand times over that make them billionaires because of the dedication they had to that long-term vision. And if you look at the 10 values that Nike had when they first started, I recommend that somebody Google this. It, they're it, unbelievable. Really, really, you can tell that from day one, they were a very different company than, than most companies are. And, and, and I think that's why they make it. And, and many brands that do make it that big, they had a very similar mindset. I think Google is a similar thing. I think, you know, Facebook is a similar thing. There's reasons why these brands make it in a big way. I will show you on my phone uh, the book that I, I guess on the audio version, you won't see this, but this is the book I'm actually reading right now. Oh, there you go. Shoe Dog. With, with, Shoe Dog. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the memoir by, by Phil Knight. Phil and Knight. it's amazing. I believe amazing. it. Amazing. If, if anybody that wants to unpack what Mark just said, go pick up Shoe Dog. It's just, uh, it, 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 look, there's a phenomenal stories behind the people who are the most successful on the planet. OK, yeah. and it's not to say that some people haven't gotten successful by being kind of crony and a little, right. you know, look, there, there are people who make it in the not so great kind of way. OK, and and for every one of those, there's a lot of people who've made it in a big way because they solve really big problems. And, and sometimes those problems are really simple, by the way, like they could be the simplest, stupidest little thing. Um, but they were just there and they, they solved that problem. Like. Like oh, I, you watch it all the time. I look on a Shark Tank, right? Like right. one of the most successful things you ever see on Shark Tank was this one little guy with his, it's a sponge. It's a sponge with a smiley face on it. And it's a phenomenal thing because it got, it sold everywhere because, because it's a better sponge. It, it, it literally is just a better mousetrap than right. the other alternative. And it, because it has a little smiley, it's easy to clean spoons because you can push, you know, push the oh, spoon right the, through the, the mouth or whatever it is, right? right. It, it sounds so silly, but that, but that 
is a better product that at the end of the day with good distribution and good execution and the fact that they got on Shark Tank, which he did work to get on, right. all of which worked. And that's one of the most successful brands I've ever had on Shark Tank. So it, it doesn't, you don't need to be Elon Musk and redefine an entire industry to make a lot of money if you're, if you're thinking about things in a different way. And rather than, like, I think the first thing that people fail at is they think, how do I become a millionaire? And that's the worst way to go about it. Right. Like, th that's the real bait and switch of what you're doing. It's like, you're, you're telling people, you're, you're, you're attracting them based on the thing that they're after. But if they were after, how do I solve a million people's problems? Then they'll become a millionaire. Like, yeah. it's just a mentality shift. It's just a completely different way of thinking about things that changes the game and changes your results. And, and I, wanna, I wanna add to that. I wanna put the cherry on top of that. The yeah. one person whose problems do not matter in terms of how the market values what you do are your problems. Mm -hmm. You're actually the one person who no one will pay to solve that person's problems. I agree. So when you're wanting to make a million dollars because it's gonna solve all your problems, you're, you're, you're starting with a mission that's by definition worth $0 Yep. to the people whose money you need to solve exactly. that problem, right? Now, exactly. if you say, I'm going to help a million people and I, I don't even, I'm not even one of the million, yep. now you have a shot. Absolutely. And now how you go about that, well, you know, as people ask me all the time, well, what makes Superhero Academy different? And the answer is it's just mentorship-based. It's a yeah. school that's mentorship-based. It's, it's taught by people who have done the thing that they say they're going to do. And there's a lot of fake shitty online courses out there um and they just don't necessarily have the follow-through and the capacity and the access that they need and i get it because it scales where many people are trying to scale the dream i have this passive revenue that nah, 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 blah 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 i get it Is it possible? Is it boring possible? lame yeah it's lame and, it just, and it's and it's not really real it can be once you've done all the non-passive things that yeah, now like you, now have money that you can now make quote unquote money passively, but even billionaires actively manage their money. What I mean by that is they still have people who are monitoring the markets and moving the money in through the markets. They're monitoring with the real estate they're invested in. There's, there's always some level of, of, of work involved. And if you're buying the dream and you're always looking for the shortcut, your mentality is the problem that it, it in and of itself is the, your, your, you're essentially fueling the cancer that is killing you, <laughs> that right. is killing your dreams. And, and, and that's, it's, there's, you're not going to get into better shape by eating sugar. So why are you trying to take the sugar version of a career? You know what I mean? Why? Like, that's just not, it's just not going to work. There's no fast food way to get healthier. It's just yeah. not, it's not the, the capacity for that to happen. And, and it can be as simple as being incredibly consistent. Like if I were to give people a single skill that I think would change their entire life. There's, uh, there's two of them that I think are one or the other could be really powerful, but I'll, I'll stay the one that I think is the most powerful. Really good planning and scheduling. That's it. I truly believe that if people are really good at like thinking about what they need to do, writing it down and then putting it on their calendar and just being really consistent about doing, following their calendar. If they do that, every week and every day, that is the number one determinant of whether or not you're going to be successful at whatever you're trying to achieve. To me, I know the difference between a successful person and a non-successful person by looking at their calendar and the way that they plan to schedule. That is everything to me. Everything, when I want to hire somebody, I'm like, show me your calendar. Yeah. Show me the way you plan and schedule. That's it. It's all I need to know. Because everything comes to me from that. Because it's, the most valuable asset. And it's the one thing, like I said, that's the most democratized, your time. Your time Amen. is everything. I, so if you can find people, for the it. Because I could not agree with you more. Yeah. And because this was the hardest lesson for me to learn because I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. I was a jazz musician, which is not even just being a musician. It's being a musician who's literally paid to make stuff up on the spot. Totally. You know, so I was a creator. I was a a, a free thinking, free living person. And I used creativity as an excuse to have sloppy, indulgent habits. Sure. It was very hard for me, but I will say that since if you were hiring me at my job interview, this would be my calendar. For there you go. Your calendar's 
Oops. Super. I mean, there's just all kinds of things on it, and it's very clear. clear that literally, I mean, it's literally like every it. hour of the day, and I'm sharing that, oh. you know, for anybody seeing this on YouTube, because like, you know, we talk about a lot of stuff on this show, but I, I like to think that everyone that I have on this show, and myself included, like we we put our money where our mouth is, um, and and honestly, I could not agree with you more, um, and I think that. I, I, I detect in a lot of entrepreneurs, especially because, I mean, let's face it, somebody's already thinking or leaning entrepreneur to probably be into this conversation. If they're listening, if they're this far, they're definitely there. Yeah. And so a lot of entrepreneurs, because they are pursuing freedom, they're trying to break out of this cage or cast off the bonds of employment or corporatocracy or whatever, uh, sometimes they mistake freedom with a lack of discipline yes and i'm gonna that's why i'm saying what i'm saying is they are not this i mean jocko willink says literally discipline equals freedom 100 percent. which by the way i mean try running a farm without discipline well, you, you can't that's the beautiful thing about things like farms is that unless you understand that certain things have to happen before other things happen like you cannot plant garlic without prepping the garden bed. But if you're not going to prep the garden bed and you didn't order the earth to make the garden bed or you didn't prepare the soil or get the thin, da, 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 there's all these, there's a process of operations that is very, 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 very clear that has to happen in some way when it comes to farming. When it comes to online stuff, everyone's chasing after the newest thing all the time, right? Like everyone's talking right now about uh, what's that app that everyone's talking about? Um, oh, what's the name of the app? I probably don't even know because unless I need it for my life, I'm... clubhouse. Yeah. It's clubhouse. It's oh, okay. like, I actually did get on that. the clubhouse, 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 clubhouse. I, I, why are we valuing all the, the, we're always valuing this new thing, the new shiny object. And I, I guarantee you next week, I'm going to see a webinar five ways. You can get more leads on clubhouse. Right. And look, I get it. It's great. Somebody's taking the opportunity and jumping on it. That's perfect. That's amazing. But if that's not what you need to be doing right now, is that truly fundamental to your business? Is that truly in the long-term interest of what you're trying to create versus going really deep on the place where you do care? Like for me, YouTube and podcasts and audio is the place I want to I want to focus on the most. I did it on Instagram, Facebook and Instagram. I have some real estate there, what I would consider to be attention real estate, meaning I own a bunch of Facebook pages and a bunch of Instagram accounts. So I have influence there and I can transfer that influence to other places. Now, do I think Gary Vee was right when he was saying LinkedIn is a great place to go and build? Yeah, I do. But should everyone go and build on, on LinkedIn? No, not necessarily. And it, because it depends on what industry you're in and what's truly valuable and who you're serving and where they are, what the culture of the platform is. So if you're serving people who care about fashion, LinkedIn is probably not the place to be scaling your content. And it's probably Instagram or Pinterest, right? Mm-hmm. So there are, there are, you have to, focus on the on on what your customers and what the people you're serving are really needing what the solutions are for them and then how do you stay focused within that within your own planning and scheduling to kind of march forward in a powerful way and i i I think where that gets really interesting is where you balance between working in your business and therefore serving those customers and working on your business which is building your brand that then communicates what you serve and who you serve and how you serve them Right. And if you can kind of balance those two things a little bit, and, and I think for most part, when you're, when you're really starting up, you can only kind of balance it maybe 80, 20, right. You have to be working, serving your customers 80% of the time, about right. 20% of the time branding. But as you get richer in your, in your brand presence and who you are, you then have more and more through your discipline, have more and more freedom to essentially start working on your brand. And that's where you see a massive acceleration. And it's, and it's how I get on this podcast right here, right? Like, I have no idea how you discovered me other than the fact that I know I've done a lot of branding, a lot right. of branding that eventually got to the point where my podcast is named, uh, you know, top 20 podcasts of, for an entrepreneur for 2020 or top 21 podcasts you absolutely need to hear in 20, uh, 2021. I have both those titles that happened in 2020 or 2019 and in 2020 that lead to people discovering me. And so I get booked on way more podcasts by doing this one exercise, which is focus on one core thing, one core pillar. I know I'm going to get a bunch more of the other thing. And somebody who's listening to this is like, man, this guy's maybe I should hire this guy. And that's welcome to 
my branding meets my execute my, my capacity to then have an offer and blah, 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 blah. And it's a self-generating cycle because I treat it like an ecosystem, just like I would on a farm. And for the record, I have no idea how we found you either. Because I have, no, yeah. I have I believe- somebody else working in the business to find you. I know. Like you. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah. But, that, but guess what? I know that that person's an employee and they're going to do this simplest thing ever, Google. Yeah. They're going to do the thing. So I, where do I have to win? Google. Yeah, exactly. I have to win, not with you. With you, I'm going to meet you at a mastermind or at an event or whatever. I, I know where I can meet somebody like you, right? And you know where you can meet somebody like me. But when it comes down to the way that I know people are booking their podcasts, I know that the thing that they're going to do is they're going to Google and they're going to go after, they're going to go down the checklist. Right. <laughs> and, and, and so great. So I, I was like, okay, well, let me get to the top of Google. And I did. I did. And, and by getting to the top of Google, by just focusing on saying, I'm going to use the same words over and over and over again in every podcast. You think it's the first time I said the ROI of return on investment? Right, right. You really think, you know what I mean? Like you think it is the first, like you even said it, you said it in my opener, philanthropist, which is maybe either a word you coined or at least you're trying to own in some way, shape or form. It's not by accident. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's not an accident in any way, shape or form. So there are words that are associated to me and storylines that are associated to me because I planted those things. And it's because they're real, but they're also stories that I've seeded. Right. Stories that I seed, but before we get on this podcast, stories that have seeded in what you can Google about me, stories that have seeded on my website, in my video content, in every single way, shape, or form. And so, because everything about me has to scream farmer, philanthropist, and storyteller. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Um, so, I'm going to end with one final quick question to, to illustrate a point. I already know what, I already roughly know what the answer is going to be, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Sure. Since you switched, switched, let's say evolve maybe yeah, from better. this uh, fuel of, you know, the anti-fuel, right? The proving yep. people wrong fuel or the whatever kind of into, into a fuel that's more around love and service to humanity. Yep. That was how many years ago? I mean, it's hard to say it was a transition over time. I think it like fully locked into place in the last 18 months. Okay. Like, and, and, so, and it kind of, it locked into place through many things, including heartbreak in some ways and other, it, all, all kinds of stuff. But over so, the last 18 months, it's definitely locked in or since okay. like I turned 30 roughly. So last, last couple of years, let's say, yeah. without giving the, I don't need, I don't care about the, the, I guess the values, cause I'm not asking you how much money you make, but sure. purely the multiple. What's happened to your income in the last oh, few months? Oh, absolutely changed everything. I mean, the easiest way to say it is I actually pay myself more because I love myself more. That's the, fast, that's the first thing I'll say. Yeah. The first thing I say is I used to believe that I was valuable because of how much I worked and therefore how much I can hire other people and how much I can give other people because I was valuing myself at the lowest at the lowest possible totem pole as an entrepreneur. I was like, I'll pay everyone and then eventually I'll pay me. And- That happened in every way, meaning I was not eating the right foods. I was not spending enough time working out. I was not spending, I was not loving myself in all the ways that I can show love to myself. And so by having switched that, like now I work out first thing every day, all the time. I have a personal trainer. I have have somebody who prepares my meals. I don't cook, but somebody prepares every single one of my meals and they're healthy. And so, so I save the time which I can then spend earning more money or doing more things or making more art, telling more stories. Right. But by, by focusing on what is the thing that is my highest good and therefore the highest way that I can love myself first, then from the overflow of that, give to everyone else, that has shifted everything within me. And that took years of <laughs> psychedelics, years of coaching, years of all kinds of stuff, all of which was in service to this very shift that I think happened over the entire time. But it took certain brick walls for me to hit that recognize like, I just can't keep, I cannot keep fueling myself in this way. I can't keep doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result because it's the definition of madness, right? The definition of insanity of sorts. So I, I just, I hit that brick wall. I learned the lesson multiple times over the hard way. But I also had learned in many scenarios, the lesson the easy way, which is find people who have done it before and figure out what they're doing. And when I really think about it, a lot of the most successful people, the people I want to emulate are loving and showing themselves some form of love in some way, shape or form. 
They are not necessarily hustling the entire time. And even when you hear the Gary V's of the world being like, hustle, 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 he's not wrong, specifically for the people who need to start and the type of person who has the time or takes the time to listen to Gary V speak for the most part, like over and over and over again. I'm not saying hear a piece of content from Gary, but I'm talking about over and over and over again. If you're listening to motivational content on YouTube and you have the time to do that, that is the message you have to hear in mm-hmm. some ways. Right. But when you're listening to the nuances of what Gary's talking about, like, oh, should he, well, how is he investing in Snapchat or how is he doing his strategy on LinkedIn? When you're listening to those types of music content, I don't need the motivation anymore. You're listening to for information that I can actionably apply. And that's different than the general trend of what people associate to Gary Vee, which is hustle, quote unquote. Right, right. So for me, the transition wasn't, wasn't overnight. It, there was no specific secret. It's not like, oh, take a hero's dose of mushrooms and that's what's going to change your life. Uh, it can. I, it has for me many times in many ways. But what it did is it changed my perspective many times over as to what I was doing. And it allowed me to see the dots. It allowed me to essentially see the ecosystem more and, and see what weeds were in my own garden and in my own mind. And by meticulously plucking those weeds and meticulously replacing them with the flowers and the fruits and the vegetables that I wanted to have in the garden, that is exactly how physically in the farm, I've transformed the farm from a GMO cornfield to a full on eco paradise and, and you know food forest, let's say. And that's exactly how I also transitioned from the negative kind of unsustainable fuel, let's say the dirty fuel to the much more renewable, self-generating and regenerative, in fact, fuel. And so I just, I, I you know, I used to ask myself, um, I used to ask myself this one fundamental question that I've now shifted, which is the question I used to ask myself was, what would Batman do? And I think Batman would martyr. That's the answer. Some way of he would hustle, he would push, he would fight for justice, no, 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 all of which are noble but all of which imply some level of martyrism. Right. I used to believe in that mentality. It's why I created Superior Academy. It's why I named it that. And what I now ask myself is some level of what would nature do? Mm. And what nature would do is it would, it, would, it would generate, it would regenerate in some way, shape, or form, some level of regenerate. And it would take the resources it needs and then grow in the way that it needs. And then hopefully... You're not unlucky and uh, some big storm comes by and rips the tree out of the ground or whatever thing. There are other factors, but at the end of the day, even with those factors, nature will just respond by regenerating it all over again. Mm -hmm. And so I just learned to ask myself a different question and therefore to change the narrative that I had of myself, the inner story that I had of myself, which is to be successful, I need to martyr. Instead, to be successful, I need to mimic nature. Maybe it's a different way of going about it. Or I need to mimic the world around me. Or I need to, mi- or I need to mimic success. That's another way of saying it. And that fundamentally shifted when I decided I am enough. I love myself. I get to love myself. I deserve love. As variations of those exact things, all of which sound really hippie and whatever, but they're exactly what we need here. They're exactly the lessons I need to have, and that's and that's fundamentally fully shifted my my reality in every way. So. As predicted, since that transition occurred and it became more focused around love and service than, oh, uh, 10x. As, you put it, as you put it, martyrdom, uh, a massive boost in your income. I have experienced the same. I am ending on that note to convey to everyone that you do not have to wait to be rich to make the world a better place. In fact, you might have to wait to be rich until you make the world a better place. <laughs> I, I, I would personally agree with that, yes. Um, thank you, man. This has been a fantastic conversation. I so applaud what you're doing. I want to be a, a bigger fan, and I know others will too. Where can we go to get more of your wisdom and insight? Uh, if you got to this point in the podcast, you absolutely know where the links are. I don't need to tell you, but what I would prefer that you do is that you actually leave a comment, that you rate this podcast, that you do something that shows love for the show that you've just listened to. Not my show, this show. Because at the end of the day, if you got all the way here, you found value in this podcast. And the easiest way to pay it back is with a little bit of your attention, a little bit of your time, totally free for you to do. But if you click that like button, you click that subscribe button, you click that rate button, that's exactly what you need to do. Now, you want to find me? You know where to find me. 
Yeah. Fine. And of course, we'll put the links in the description regardless. But that's the whole point. Are, are you saying <laughs> that you can leave comments, feedback, and reviews on the internet that are positive, not just negative? I, that's what I'm encouraging people to do. Whoa, mind blown. <laughs> that's amazing. Awesome. Dude, this has been fantastic. Mark, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much for being a guest on Millionaire Secrets. And I look forward to, to staying in touch and deepening this relationship because I think it's just wonderful what you're doing. No, oh, thank you so much. Thanks you so much for having me. And thank you everyone who's listening to this for your attention and uh, see you in the next episode or the next, wherever you yeah. click on the links that you click. For sure. Yes. Thank you to the audience, the, the watchers and listeners. You guys are the best part of this show and why we do what we do. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.